Traditionally, as we've seen so far, body horror has been pretty male-centric, or at least told through a male lens, whether it's Eli Roth's Hostel or David Cronenberg's The Fly. But throughout the 21st century, there have been films from new, interesting voices that look at body horror through a female lens, like Ginger Snaps or American Mary. The two films we're discussing this week, one from 2007, the other from 2016, both put female bodies front and centre in gruesome and hilariously nasty stories, one of which was considered so shocking festival audience members were literally taken ill and had to be carried out by paramedics. <laughs> Join me as we continue exploring the mind and body as we discuss Julia DeCorno's Raw and Mitchell Lichtenstein's Teeth. Welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike, and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. We are currently in our sixth series, exploring the mind and body in horror cinema, and this is part 26. This week's episode is sponsored by $20 patron Trina Findlay, and in this week's episode, we're going to be discussing two female-centric body horrors, Teeth from 2007 and Raw from 2016. These will both be spoilerific reviews. I would urge you guys to check both movies out if you can before listening to our discussion. Both films are so entertaining, so interesting and so much fun. Before we get started on this week's episode, just wanted to issue a quick apology uh, about something from last week's episode, which has been flagged by quite a lot of you guys throughout the week on social media. Now, I did uh, reply to this and I put out a statement on social media, but I just wanted to say it again so that it was clear. Uh, last week, me and Adam, we were discussing Eli Roth's Cabin Fever and Hostel, and we briefly spoke about the film Hard Candy from 2005. It's a fantastic film. Now, that film stars Elliot Page. When me and Adam recorded our conversation. Uh, this was actually a while ago. It was back in mid-November. We discussed uh, the movie on the 18th of November. Now, this occurred before Elliot Page had come out as trans and had changed names and pronouns. So in the discussion, when me and Adam discuss Hard Candy, I refer to Elliot Page by his previous name and pronoun. Um, a few people very rightly flagged this to me, sent me messages and emails about it throughout the week. Um, so I do apologise for that. It was entirely my fault in that I should have flagged at the top of the episode that the discussion, the conversation was recorded before uh, Elliot Page came out as trans. Um, so I'm sorry if there was any confusion there or if that was jarring to anybody in particular. So I just wanted to make that clear one more time. Hopefully you all know that wasn't down to ignorance or spite or anything like that. It was purely bad podcast editing <laughs> because I should have made an announcement at the beginning of last week's episode, which I completely forgot to do. So just one more time I wanted to apologize if that offended anybody um, and just explain that again that was recorded before Elliot Page had changed names and pronouns but thank you so much to all of you for politely pointing that out to me and thank you all for being so understanding okay let's get started on this week's episode joining me to discuss all things raw and teeth a longtime friend of the pod she was last here with me on the main podcast discussing the craft uh, so it's been a while and it's wonderful to have her back welcome to the podcast Louise Blaine. Hello. Hello, Mike. How are you? I'm I'm all right, thank you. Happy New Year. How was your Happy Christmas break? It was very peaceful. I mm -hmm. was very fortunate in the fact that uh, because I'd been a little bit unwell at the start of December, I was actually isolating throughout December, so I didn't feel bad about yes. going to stay with my parents. So I okay. went. To, uh, so I, I was. I saw nobody, and then I went to stay with them for over a week. And oh, nice. It was really nice just to be chill and peaceful. Yeah. So I felt very lucky that I could do that, really. Oh, that's great. That's lovely. Did you um, have a nice time? I did. It, uh, you know, same really. I didn't. I didn't get to see parents or anything. But I was with Rihanna. We just we we did have a turkey that we were 
planning on we were planning on hosting other people for Christmas dinner. They couldn't come anymore, so we had to yes. eat like a six person turkey between the two of us. That's but you know, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? That is a uh, lot of turkey. It's a lot of turkey, but we, we we got through it. We managed it. You start getting good. really inventive with turkey, don't you? Like, okay, yeah. so I'll have it with gravy and turkey stuffing. Turkey curry and then, and then soup. <laughs> yeah. uh, what can we do with this? Turkey fajitas and yeah, exactly. <laughs> any any form of turkey. Uh we've done it. So that was good. And then the last week or two, I don't know i feel like i should be in a much more uh i should be in a much darker state of mind right now because i've been watching a mix of kind of extreme cinema and cnn and like that's enough to really what's the difference (laughs) i know right at the moment (laughs) like i don't know whether i'm watching i I love the fact that you're doing all this because i i do not envy the films that you've been watching and i I was saying to you earlier i listened to you know your discussion about hostel Yes. and Cabin Fever and I loved your discussion about Martyrs but they all made me really glad that I wasn't watching them <laughs> it's like that's enough just hearing Mike's like super scary intros is quite enough for I me do. I've seen these I'm it's, done it's weird though isn't it I mean I don't know if you find this when you podcast it is almost like a sort of it is almost like a kind of therapy though like I wouldn't oh, totally. ever just watch them to watch them but watching them with the intention of then discussing them for an hour kind of makes it all feel okay you know yeah I think that's the real difference and I think what's quite interesting about body horror especially is the fact that so many of us feel like we have to watch it and learn about out and talk about it and analyze it because yes. we're desperately trying to get away from the fact that when we tell people we like horror that that's what we like yeah exactly. so it's constantly like no 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 martyrs isn't my favorite horror film no 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 i really like <laughs> other things but please <laughs> yeah. please let me explain <laughs> yeah yeah it's true it's true i think this is the the sort of stuff that people who hate horror assume all horror fans love is yeah the body horror, the blood and guts and gore and torture. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually that we've moved seamlessly into what was going to be my first question for you, which was the topic of body horror. Um, how are you with body horror, Louise? Are you good? Are you squeamish? Do you enjoy this kind of subgenre? This isn't really my genre, really. <laughs> Other than the two movies we're talking about today, this isn't really my genre. I don't, I, I am not particularly squeamish. Other than things about teeth. Which uh-huh. is funny, given what we're going to talk about. But I have <laughs> real issues with things about teeth. And I think it's that thing of, you know, if you've got something in your past that's particularly unpleasant with something, you'll be much more sensitive to it. So I had mm-hmm. 14 teeth taken out when I was very young. Oh. I had horrible, miserable dental experiences. I don't have any canines, which, mm-hmm. you know, just makes me jealous of everyone else. But so there's lots of different things about teeth that I find unpleasant. And that yeah. quite often raises its ugly toothy head in body horror people love removing teeth and stomping them and smashing them out everything else i can kind of take i don't enjoy it you know if that comes up at i think you and i were sitting at fright fest and watching the film that's now become i think ringmaster which is particularly Mm. unpleasant and it's just like I could watch someone have their nipple pierced with a pin badge, but I'd just rather not. <laughs> I know, I know. And, you know, there are different types. It's a broad net, isn't it? Because there's, 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 there's your kind of torture porn stuff, like Hostel, yeah. like that film that we watched at Fright Fest, which I don't think either of us are particularly big fans of. I am kind of a fan of the more traditional body horror in the vein of kind of the films we're about to talk about today yeah. and also, you know, the movies of David Cronin. But I don't know, yeah. movies that feel like they've got a little bit more to them, maybe. There is. And I think I love good splatter. I love yeah. a good splatter. You know, I really, it makes me laugh in a really fun way. Like when I was watching The Hunt from earlier this year, which I oh, really yeah. love. Yeah. And it, it was really fun and splattery. Mm-hmm. Like every, there was a point where I think, you know, I'm not going to spoil anything, someone near the start literally is just has their, I think their skull exploded. And it's gleeful, positive. I get, he, I yes. genuinely get, like I get excited. <laughs> so I am definitely not anti people being sawn to bits and all of those things at all in any way. So it's, I think it is, as you say, it's how things are dealt with. Yes, whether they're yes. funny or serious, and, and and it's that different type of body horror. And I've talked about this a lot on this series, but I think it's relevant to what we're going to talk about today. Which is, I'm the same as you. I can handle like a really over the top uh, slasher movie where you know Jason will squeeze somebody's eyeball out of their own head in 3D yes. or something, and it's like fine, yes. whatever, that's hilarious. But watching somebody pull their own fingernails out, or again, like you mentioned, watching somebody have a tooth removed, or watching somebody pick a scab or itch a rash, is yeah. the stuff that I really hate. I struggle with, you know. 
it's those little moments, yeah. I think. I remember, um, do you remember that terrible House of Wax remake with Paris Hilton? Yes. Do you remember that there's a little scene in it where someone puts their finger up through a grate? <laughs> yes, yes, I do. <laughs> and of all of that movie, you know, which has the guy from Supernatural having wax literally melt the skin off his face. Uh-huh. My enduring memory of that movie is that little finger coming up through that grate because totally. we all have fingers. We mm. all have toes. We all have skin. And we it all, the closer it gets to us, the worse it gets. So while yes. you can have the hostel and the eyeballs and we, we do cower and, ugh, and that's gross and terrible. But I think it's those little things, mm. those little scratches and little hangnails. Yes. that are too close. I agree. And I, I, really interestingly as well, I think a lot of the body horrors I've been talking about, the classic body horrors, have been a, a bit more male-centric. They've been a bit more, yeah. they've been a bit more bro-y or they've been a bit more about the male body. I think the two yes. movies we're about to talk about are very, very much female-centric, aren't they? Do you think yes. there's... Is there a difference there as well? Do you think people react differently to kind of female body horror, to male body horror? I think that's what's going to be really interesting to talk about here mm. because these two movies react very very differently to the female body yes they empower the female body they use the female body as a weapon and Mm -hmm. that's very different for horror because we're very used to final girls and while the final girls we watch become powerful through their survival um they're they're beating the rest well everyone else dies around them they're victorious they're yes they're fighting back but they are not using their body as literally a tool a powerful tool and yeah. while both of the films that we're going to talk about have women who learn their power and wield it correctly mm-hmm. i think that's really these aren't they are a very different approach to bodies but it's very empowering regardless yeah i agree i think there's something really interesting about it and and in in a weird way still feels a bit taboo and shocking because i th- yeah. and i think it's because it's more female centric um particularly teeth because teeth was 10 10 15 years ago now and it was right in the midst of that kind of you know i was listening to uh, good friends of the pod uh Stacey Ponder on the Gay Lords of Darkness talking about this era as bro, she called it bro horror. And yeah. there was a lot of that at the time. Movies from, of course, people like Eli Roth, Rob Zombie, yes. all of those movies that were very popular at the time. And movies like Teeth and Jennifer's Body that yes. kind of completely died a death at that point. And I think now have only just started to be appreciated as kind of cult classics. Do you know what I mean? I think what's quite interesting about the presentation of the female body as well, and especially as we're going to come on to with Raw. I find that the most stark female imagery because it is it shows that we all have bodies that do things. Mm, we have bodies mm. that are hairy and yeah. that have desires and they are not... And I, I'm going to say this now before we even do it. When I spoke to the director of Raw, she was very much talking about the fact that Julia de Curnow was talking about the fact that the female body has been Hollywoodized for so long uh-huh. and just perfectly polished and these ideas of what you should look like. And that hasn't, that's not gone anywhere. That, that's, mm-hmm. it's, you know, this was, um, what, Teeth was 2007, I think. Se- okay, 2007 for that and 20, yeah, a couple of years ago for, for yeah. Teeth. But women are still this perfect example and Instagram is filled with what women are meant to be. And then all of a sudden you're like, no, women are like this. They pee and poo and they throw up and they itch and they, and all of these things are shown in that movie. And it's such a relief to yeah. be able to say, yes, this is actually what humans look like. Yeah. And the horror is almost a side. I'd almost, there, there's more horror in that movie and we'll talk about it in a bit, then then there is cannibalism, basically. Totally, The horror is human, not necessarily monstrous. I agree. Uh, It's really interesting. And like you say, you talked about the final girl and and the the typical thing, and obviously the thing that people like Carol J. Clover and critics have talked about for years is that idea of so many horror films being about a man with a very phallic weapon, like a big old knife that they use to penetrate a woman. Both of the movies in this, the women, we would debate about whether or not the women are in in like kind of the villains or the monsters of these movies, but the way in which they kill their victims is that they 
consume them, right? They're not yes. penetrating them as much as they are eating them. One yep. literally with her mouth and the other one in another way. But in it's the way. same way, right? It's the same way in which they are both kind of, they're consuming rather than penetrating, I suppose, which is interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the consumption and I think that learning of power. And I think it's something we spoke about when we talked about when we were on, um, you know, witches, when we we're talking about witches, yeah. here's this, here's this female empowerment. And the fact that we can have that in the body horror in your mind and body section yes. is really actually really, really exciting because it means that it, it's nice because it means that women aren't having to use, yes, witches use a sort of magical power, but there's almost a separation. Yeah. But this is the use of your own body and it's a lot there's um, an amazing um book called the power by naomi alderman and it's about women suddenly develop this electrical skein across their chest which can electrocute men oh yes and, I've heard about and it's yeah. and it's suddenly this um this weapon that they develop and all of a sudden the entire power balance and inherent misogyny that takes place on a day-to-day -day basis was completely cancelled out when mm -hmm. it turns out women had weapons too and that's what Teeth and Raw both do in two very different ways, is they hand you power and they say, what are you going to do with it and how yeah. are you going to grow? And in such a feminine way too, because the like you said about witches, I think it was Anna Bogutskaya on this podcast who was talking about how the witch was one of the only kind of uh, female, uh, powerful female figures in fiction that isn't masculinized. That yes. you know, when you get a quote unquote strong woman, it's often because she's Ripley and she's she's more manly, or she's donning yeah. a gun or a knife or a sword or a Sarah Connor or whatever. And again, there's none of that in these two films. Again, you've got women using their very unique feminine powers, I suppose, yes. to to to. Win Wield power, yeah, it's yeah. really interesting. Um, so let's get into it then. Let's yes, let's, let's begin by it. talking about this hilarious film, Teeth, from two thousand and seven. There is something inside of me that's lethal. Dentata. What? It's Latin for teeth. It's what's inside me. Are you afraid? Uh, Louise, what's the story of teeth? <laughs> <laughs> So the story of Teeth is a young woman who is Christian um, and she is she runs Christian camps and talks to children about purity. And she mm. wears a ring that represents purity, which is, you know, you're saving yourself for your future husband. And it's all about purity. And she begins having the teenage desires that we all have growing up. And suddenly she's quite challenged by these and desiring a man. But she discovers in her burgeoning sexuality that she, in fact, has teeth in her vagina. Mm. Hence, teeth and probably, I think, one of my favourite horror posters of all time. <laughs> yeah. Do you mean the one with, like, the X-ray? The inward E. Yeah, the X-ray. So there's an X-ray and there's two inward E's in the <laughs> pelvis. And it's just <laughs> the most magnificent thing. I love it. I love it. It's so good. So what is your own sort of personal history and relationship with this film? When did you first see it and are you a fan? So I love this film, uh -huh. as you would expect from me absolutely cackling about this. I saw this film in the cinema in Glasgow and mm -hmm. I took my cousin to see it and she had no idea what we were going to watch. And I don't think many of the mostly women in Glasgow in the screening also <laughs> knew what they were going to see. And it was genuinely one of the most fun, riotous cinema experiences I think I've had in years. It was almost like it was like a Fright Fest screening out in the wild. Because there were clearly people, there was a, a lot of probably quite silent dudes and a lot of <laughs> women just cackling. And because I don't think, I'd, I'd certainly never seen anything quite like this because it gets very gruesome. It does. Very, very, very gruesome. And I think what it also manages to do, and I think the main thing that I take from this film is it's in comparison to Raw, this film takes place in a heightened reality yes. where... Everything is, the colours are very, very bright and the music is almost cartoonish. Mm -hmm. It takes place in this heightened reality, but, and what keeps it grounded and why I love it so much is because you always feel for her and you're always with her and it's very human and sometimes it's desperately sad. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd forgotten how sad it was. Yeah. 
Yeah. But it's also hilarious. Oh, it's tremendous, isn't it? I absolutely love this film as well. And um, I watched it when it first came out as well. And I remember having fond memories of it. And I haven't revisited it until this week, which was my second watch. And I loved it even more than first time round, I think. Yeah. It's so funny. It is still quite shocking. It's still gross, but also it's smart. Uh, yeah, I love it. I think it's aged very well as well. You know, I, I think it's a film that really holds up. Yeah, I hadn't seen it since that first watch because mm-hmm. I think after that first watch you know what that feeling is and you know that plot and there's yes. no like oh I need to rewatch teeth right now yeah. that, that yeah. doesn't <laughs> I haven't had that happen personally but watching it again I was like this all holds up mm-hmm. it's I, I appreciate it potentially even more now than I did yeah and there's a lot more going on I feel like yeah. looking at it with these eyes for oh gosh 14 years 14 later? 14 years later, yeah. And actually what's lovely about it as well is that it's a very simple film as well, really. Yes. It's like you can trace the story and what happens in a couple of paragraphs almost, you know, in terms yeah. of what her journey is from beginning to end. But it's so great and it works so well. Um, I think so much of that is down to the lead performance, right, of Jess Wexler as Dawn. Yeah. What did you think of her? Because I just, I, I can't believe she's not a bigger deal than she is, really. Yeah. That was the thing. When I was watching her, I was like, why are you not... Why haven't I seen you everywhere since? Yeah. Because she just brings this perfect... And I think what's interesting about it is she brings this real innocence to that character where you don't feel frustrated by her. You feel like you're really... You know, you feel like you're doing the right thing. Yeah. Everyone is taking the piss out of you. Like, this isn't your fault. You know, Mm. I feel like I really felt all the way with her. Yeah. And everything about her from her like t-shirts with unicorns on them and <laughs> her, you know, her sequins and her ballet dancer bedroom full of pink things. And it's just this perfect imagining of what it is, to, almost the, being trapped as a woman yeah. and, and being trapped as a young woman and being trapped in what you think is the right thing and what, what is expected of good little girls. And I mm. think it's this perfect box that she's having to suffer through and the discovery of how how she comes out of it is just unbelievable i love it so good the the sort of journey that she goes on and the way that that, you know the the kind of the final few shots of her and how different she is and how much more empowered she is is really fun and really funny as well and you know horror comedy it's a really difficult balance isn't it i think we've talked about this a lot before but that how do you think it balances that the idea of being a horror film but also being a comedy i think it does it really well i think it's really interesting the fact that as over the past couple like i suppose the last decade of horror we've um we've seen a lot of bad comedy horror i think or yes. things that just land really badly and i think i appreciate now when i can be made to laugh at a dark situation and i think that's what i think that's what this film does so well is the fact that you're laughing <laughs> while you're horrified and at no point that you don't you don't yeah. remove the feelings it's it's the exact the i think this should really be next to dark comedy in a dictionary like there is a point where actually i'll bring it up just now is the fact that she obviously falls for that lovely sweet guy who we mm. think is a really sweet lovely guy and they have this lovely romance and he looks so innocent yeah. he's like a puppy and he's really sweet and he's defending her in the he's defending her in the class and they go for this swim and they go into the cave and they start fooling around and she says no and the movie immediately immediately the horror arrives like a uh, train mm-hmm. and it hits you in the face because it turns out mm-hmm. he's just going to rape her he's just going to take what he wants and but until then we'd had this lovely like beautifully hued oh this is so sweet skipping through the no 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 now we have really horrific sexual violence yeah. and it was nasty and i think i don't think i felt it previously when i saw it as violently as i did this time despite despite the fact that i knew something was going to happen and I'd, I think I'd forgotten yeah. that it was so aggressive. And he grabs her hair and he smashes her off the... the she, he smashes her off yeah. the side of the yeah. cave. He, he, yeah, she basically like knocks her out. Yeah. Ah, and then she's unconscious and he's he looks horrified as if, oh no, what have I done? And then it gets worse because he's just like, and now I'm going to rape her when she's unconscious. Yeah. And you're, you're suddenly like, well, here's horror. Here's horrific horror. Yeah. And then she wakes up and... Her magical skill engages mm-hmm. and we're back in laughing territory. Yeah. Now that's 
almost effortless. And we go on the most incredible roller coaster. And that's a really pivotal moment of that is horror comedy right there, right there. That is the perfect definition of horror comedy that we can be absolutely gut punch like properly like this is it you're this is awful you're you're literally watching this going this is the worst thing i've ever seen yeah. and although it's again that heightened reality these are things that happen to young women all the time yeah all the time and and anyone watching this goes this is horrific and it's almost like it's almost like a tiny miniaturized revenge you know it's like a tiny revenge narrative in one it's a tiny rape revenge narrative it that is. happens immediately it's mm-hmm. like this is it and this movie is made up of miniature rape revenge movies. Yeah. And while we find it hilarious after each point, because she's literally sliced off, you know, a vital organ mm. with one squeeze of a muscle, that's that. Yeah. And I, it, that it, it is better now, I think, than when I enjoyed it before, because that's really bold filmmaking. It's really bold filmmaking, isn't it? Because it's a it's a very brave thing to do. To like you say, you're going for this heightened reality. It's it's so over the top, kind of comedic and almost caricature-y in the way these characters are portrayed at the beginning, right? And like totally. you say, the music, the, music. the tone, the look of it. You're so right. And then suddenly to just halt the comedy to insert a rape scene, there's a million and one ways in which we could have been like, oh, that is hideously misjudged. It's really jarring. It doesn't work. It feels just like really nasty. And you're right. Somehow it works. Somehow he manages to pivot into that kind of true realistic horror and then immediately pivot us out of it as well with that lovely cathartic violence. (laughs) Yeah, brilliant cathartic violence. And it's just, and it's almost... um, it's weirdly like Tom and Jerry at that point because <laughs> yes. the types of shots that we've been seeing as well are all these kind of mid shots quite straight into the camera. They're yeah. they're very direct. Yes. They're very cartoony. And then when you suddenly have the his reaction that we've been seeing all these lovely, they've been making, you know, puppy eyes at each other, and mm. then all of a sudden his eyes are horror because because she's done what she should have done. Yeah. <laughs> and he's surprised. Yeah. And and then there's the cut, you know to his junk just discarded (laughs) Uh, uh, and it's again like like you said really shocking but really funny it is really funny and like it is i don't know what it is there's something i think in all of us in all human beings no matter how grown up we are that is funny about seeing a willy on tv there just is absolutely (laughs) you're always gonna gasp and laugh when you see a penis on tv and even more so in this extreme circumstance right i think totally it's so funny uh, but it's that attitude as well like and that's the thing in ourselves. There's a point in the in the movie where they're looking at a book and they're looking at a book of um, the male anatomy. Mm. And the male anatomy is right there. Yeah. Here we go. Oh, you can just identify everything. Everything's nicely labelled up. Yeah. And when you turn the page to the woman, there's this like gold <laughs> sticker over it. And it's because women have a modesty. And it's like, no, no. <laughs> Everyone needs to know how everything works. And there's this really sad moment where she brings that into the bathroom and she tries to pick off the sticker to see what's underneath yeah. because she's not being told of her own biology. Yeah. And it's, that's really interesting. So while we're like, lol, willies, that's kind of the same for us. And also we'll talk about it in, in Raw when we see um, Justine having her Brazilian wax and yeah. we see her pubes. Mm. We don't see that. We don't see female genitalia. Mm-hmm. That's something. That, that's a that's a voice in horror that you're just like. Well, that's not what we see. We it, the people being shocked by seeing some pubes around some pants. Meanwhile, there's dicks everywhere. <laughs> there's junk junk for days. You, can, you know. So then seeing it just casually, just on a rock with a frog next to it was hilarious. The but I think frog, it's, yeah, it's cool. But there's something really like there's something. It's saying a lot and it fits a lot into that hour and 33 minutes. A lot. The the kind of animal imagery as well, because it is always like a severed cock with some sort of animal, animal. as well there as well, which I love. <laughs> and there is this, they don't really, which I kind of appreciate, they don't really go into the whys and the hows and the, you no. know, why is she's well, she's born with this? I mean, we see obviously yes. in the opening scene that she has this even as a little girl when yes. she's in the swimming pool with her brother and uh, with her stepbrother. And, you know, there is that brief moment isn't there in the classroom when they're talking about evolution and the way in which the rattlesnake yeah. starts to rattle I think it's funny that they chose a snake of all a serpent of all animals to kind of talk about there yes. in that kind of way right but I guess kind of basically hinting at this is a new 
a new evolution of the female form in a way and how they are sur- managed you know uh, they're basically adapting to survive you know i think and i i i, I hadn't realized this the first time and it was the fact that they're this perfect family but constantly in the background are those two chimneys. And are those two chimneys of a nuclear power plant? Yes. And has that nuclear power plant done this to her? And is that what's killed her mum? Oh my God. I did not even think about that, but you're probably right. Yeah. So like, and, and but although they say it's not, they say it wasn't his real sister, right? So mm. they say that she's not her sister. So they've adopted her. Yeah. So is basically that, the two, okay, the two parents, I think they were two single parents that got together. Oh, they were two single. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, it was two so, single parents. so it was the mum with right. the daughter and the father with the son, because I right. think in the in opening case, scene, they say something like, oh, we're not your parents. You know, we're not married yet. You know, I'm not your dad. Ah, step because I, th- I wasn't, kind of I thought, yes, right. That makes sense. Because I wasn't sure if they'd adopted her. But yeah, I imagine, I think, it's all from this nuclear power plant that's just in the background of everything. Like when she's cycling and she's singing and there's this nuclear power plant just on <laughs> huge in the distance. And it's like, yeah, this is what's caused this. This is this is an anomaly, an adaptation. So it's a kind say. of mutation then, basically. Yeah. It's kind of like a superhero yeah. origin story, essentially. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I love it. Everybody should have this superhero origin story. It's great because also the thing is that's great about it is that the, the more you learn about it, you know, she is initially completely freaked out by this power that she can't control. It happens sort of against her will at the moment yes. when she's being raped in the cave. Then, of course, later on with... And it's funny as well, because you kind of get the different kind of dweeby boys that are all yes. sort of gross and toxic and douchey in yes. their own way, right? So you have the outright rapist in the cave. Yes. Then you yes. have this other boy who actually does seduce her and actually there yes. is consensual sex, right? And it's all yeah. very like, and that scene is absolutely hilarious where he like, you know, gives her a bath and then he uses uh-huh. a little vibrator on her and all that yep. stuff is just so funny. But of course, at that moment, they have consensual sex and it yep. nothing happens right she and she's fine yeah and she's fine and he's fine you know so i like i i'm really glad we see that yeah because otherwise you'd be like well she's never going to have any sexual pleasure and that sucks yes like, exactly you're like well, is she just cursed to never to to just never do this yeah and also in terms of like the horrible toxic men can we just have a moment to talk about that gynecologist oh my god that is one of the most like I don't know what it is about that. It's something about that actor and just his character and the way he does it and the way it's like it's the little. It's he talks so about horrible. Does, does he call them socky feet? Does he call oh, them sockies? Oh. Because he's put little socks on the stirrups. It's the sounds of the, the lube as well when he's lubing yeah. up his fingers and everything. It's like I, yeah. I, I think I was more disturbed by the socks just because, <laughs> just because. Nobody likes going to the gynecologist, right? Mm-hmm. You don't like going to the gynecologist. This isn't, it's not, it's not great. I mean, honestly, I remember the last time I went to a gynecologist and it was two lovely nurses and I ended up talking to them about Rocket League while they were investigating. <laughs> Rocket League. You know, nobody, they asked what I did. I talked about video games and they're like, yeah, Rocket League. That's bizarre and strange Brilliant. and nobody likes it. And if people can make it easier, that's great. But the fact that she's young and she's naive and he's, he's gross mm-hmm. and loves his work loves Mm. his work all that making her scoot down and then he gets what's coming to him yeah in a in a brilliant magnificent way Mm -hmm. and yes you laugh and yes it's horrific but it's most horrific when you realize that he's had five four fingers removed (laughs) yes and it's like what's he doing with four fingers like what was it like and and there's just all of these layers to that where you're like this is again it's that perfect horror comedy again Mm -hmm. it's just like he's horrific i'm terrified of him oh yes you got what was coming to you you absolutely rapey bastard that's what you get yeah and again it's a very difficult thing to get right and the camera it never feels i mean correct me if i'm wrong but it never seems too leery on her or her body at any point either right no yeah and also what's funny is like I found the the double they had that cut from the in the surgery when they're looking down at the guy getting his fingers fixed and yeah. they won't he won't tell them why but then it's the same people putting on <laughs> yeah. the, the the nice guy and they're like it's almost really not worth it's not really worth bothering is it? Yeah. and again it's these lovely little comedy slices that are just comedy mm-hmm. and you've been specifically told that it's okay to hate these guys yes. I think that's the thing as well like that heightened reality of and it's something you were talking about with them um, uh, slasher villains mm. victims it being okay because they're not really named or they're yes. not personalized so it's it's okay to slaughter them yes. so these guys were 
go in great get rid of them yeah perfect yeah please remove yeah this 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 gives you that slasher thrill doesn't it of like yeah. like you said you go to the cinema everyone is laughing everyone is gasping you're not you're not really supposed to take it too seriously even though like we keep touching upon it does include this kind of really quite disturbing stuff at the really center disturbing. of it as well like a lot of sexual assault in this film you know it's, it's really scuzzy actually yeah really scuzzy the brother is spe- oh, the brother stepbrother especially oh. is is vile he is really a scary vile. character isn't he he's he a is. scary character but again what i find really again disturbing slash hilarious is that because of this childhood trauma that he doesn't remember he doesn't seem to ever want to have like vaginal sex right he's obsessed yeah. with trying to have anal sex with his girlfriend yes. and there's just like little moments that i don't think i noticed first time around like all the posters all over his wall are of like women's asses like there are no like it's, he's obsessed with asses now because yeah. that's like that's his there's thing. also like uh, the um the cuts are really amusing sometimes like yes. i hadn't realized the first time i watched it that they're, when they're the they're all going to the forest for a nice walk <laughs> and the camera cuts to this tree with just an enormous vagina in it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're just like okay i did not see that in 2007 i could certainly see it now well done congratulations <laughs> i'm seeing i'm literally just now it's like the hidden ghost in bly manor but you're just looking for sex and asses and yeah, I that's love what we've it. become now. I love Just it. Looking, endlessly looking for labia. That's us. Now. <laughs> and, it, and it is actually like kind of loosely based on some genuine folklore, like the idea of what they call vagina dentata, right? And there is a yes. kind of very brief scene where uh, Dawn just like logs onto the internet on a kind of fake yes. search engine to quickly <laughs> look it up. And we get a very quick glimpse of, of, of what this thing might be. And it's this, you know, this old thing. But it was told as folklore. These stories were told as, they were kind of cautionary tales, right? So they were the warning, they were warning men, uh, you know, about the dangers of, of, of rape, the danger to them, you know, it was trying to discourage rape. And, and I think the idea of sort of men going on this quest yes, where they might get hurt, mm-hmm. like almost like a risky quest. It's like if you're heading on in there, you, you're going to have to know that there might be here be monsters. Here be Literally, monsters. you're going to have to here be monsters. You, you don't. It's almost a cautionary tale in that way. Yeah. Where it's like you put, you know, you don't really know what you're putting what you're putting that anywhere yeah exactly be careful exactly yeah um so they go and then of course like she goes on this journey those first couple of horrific moments are as much of a surprise to her as they are to us right and then of course there is that moment where after she's had the consensual sex and she's she basically then has a boyfriend right and everything seems fine and there's like a little montage of those two having sex sex and being happy together exactly and then of course there's that horrible moment when he answers the phone to his friend whilst they're having sex and uh uh, that's it gets what gets what's coming to him right at that moment and and i, th- I think this oh. is the turning point where she she starts becoming properly empowered doesn't she i suppose like she learns yeah. how to use this thing that she's got you know yeah it, it's also the turning point of the movie when i know we'd already seen a, a little tiny decimated cop <laughs> on a rock but it was also the first time that the camera pivoted to between the legs. That is worse to me. That's worse than the severed yeah. cock. It's the yeah, it's that... the kind of like mutilated groin area that is really disturbing. How do you feel about that? I hate it. it. Like that is the one moment where I almost had to look away. It's something about how like dark and black the blood is in that area yes. as well. You know, I don't know. I, I think the practical effects actually, because I'm assuming this is quite a cheap film. Uh, yeah. But I do think it still looks pretty horrific. You it know? does look horrific. Yeah. It was really weird and spurty and bloody (laughs) and horrible like there was something and i was just like i'm gonna ask mike how he feels about this because obviously i find it vile but i also it's also it's the kind it's very taboo it's very it's It's very very taboo taboo shot it's very taboo and it's not something you've seen you know you've watched enough you know big breasted woman be stabbed in the heart exactly you know, you've watched loads and loads of tits for days yeah i had never seen a, a shot like that no you know? no no nothing that is in a particularly kind of a more of a mainstream movie that isn't a sort of 70s grindhouse oh is that siri siri, siri just woke up i don't know siri didn't, <laughs> I didn't get it siri doesn't like, like the uh, siri, violence siri, towards so penises um 
Yeah, no, it's true. It's it's certainly nothing that you feel like you're going to see in kind of mainstream cinema. I mean, I remember things like that pop up in horrible 70s exploitation movies like I Spit on Your Grave. But really, you know, you don't expect to see. Again, it's still something you just do not expect to see is like violence towards male genitalia in yeah. in a lot of films, you know, that, that there's that graphic as well and that gratuitous. Yeah, it was aggressive, really yeah, aggressive. But kind of great. And, and, and yes, of course, it made me wince. It, you know, it did. But still not, still not compared to the when we talk about Raw, that movie really kind of makes me feel much more nauseous than yes. than this film. Yeah, there's does. a there's a distinct physicality which I think we'll go on to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly, exactly. Um, and then, yeah, what did you find? How did you find the sort of subplot to do with her mum? Because again, you know, there is that strange underlying sadness, I suppose, there to what happens with her mum, and it's quite fleeting, but I guess kind of becomes quite important in the final act with what she does to her brother. I found it really, really heartbreaking, actually. Mm. It really, I don't remember finding it as sad and horrible and disturbing yeah. back the first time I saw it. The one shot that actually, to me, was again, here's pure horror, is the shot of her mum lying in the hall unconscious and they're fucking in the background. Like a, yeah. And that's a really, again, another really brave, bold, really scuzzy disgusting mm-hmm. sequence that actually made I, I really didn't like it at all and and you were meant not, not to like it you're not meant to like it and i think i can I, I did a lot of looking through um the reviews at the time yeah and the reviews at the time were really really split like loads of people just went this is vile it's disgusting it's full <laughs> of incest and it's really disgusting and you shouldn't see it and I don't agree with any of that, mm. but I do agree that it's scuzzy and disgusting, mm-hmm. you know, and, and in order, and it's almost that push, give or take thing, isn't it? For something to be worse, for something to be, you know, validating and worth it, mm-hmm. you need to go through the horrible bits first. Yeah. And and that, I don't feel played by that. Yeah. In, in a way that some, some things will be like, well, now we're going to justify that he's a bad guy for this reason. I don't feel played by it. You know, I don't feel like it's a cheap shot in any capacity. No, it's... But I do find it deeply heartbreaking and sad, especially the shot of the nurse outside crying as she's literally crying on the corpse of her mother. It's, I mean, yeah, exactly. Horrible. Horrible. It's such a fine line, isn't it? That idea of, you know, you're making a film about violent, scuzzy people that isn't maybe in itself a violent, scuzzy movie and, you know, yeah. how uncomfortable it is in terms of how it's handled. Because again, you know, going back just a, a week to talk Talking about Hostel, that film is incredibly glossy. It's incredibly forgiving of its male, scuzzy, horrible characters in a way that is, I think, a much more heinous watch yes. than Teeth is. Even yes. though Teeth has, at its core, a lot more kind of sexual, overt sexual violence and ho- horrible people doing horrible things, uh, probably yeah. even more so than in Hostel. But yet, it isn't. I don't think as nasty and scuzzy as Hostel, you know, at its core. No, so it's interesting, not at isn't all. it? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's... Yeah, it's... Uh, the anti-Roth. Yeah, it kind of is in a weird way, isn't it? Anti-Roth, yeah. Because no male character, I suppose, is really let off the hook here. Apart from no. maybe the dad. And again, maybe dad is. maybe it's more that it's commenting on teenage boys, right? I mean, there's no... Because he's, he's a grown-up by this point, the dad. But, yes. but every other boy her age is yeah. a monster in this film, in yeah. this heightened world, right? I suppose that's a... Again, talking about this heightened reality, it is a scary fairy tale. It yeah. is... And what it's doing in that is, yes, it's saying here be monsters. And I'm sure there's plenty of the guys that that aren't in this. And you're already meant to be like, well, these are just, again, these heightened, heightened monsters, yeah. I think. And I think it's, I, I, I think it's all very justified in the fact that these are things that happen, happen to women. Yeah. They meet men who rape them. They meet men who they think have their best interests at heart. And then it turns out they've just been making bets yeah. about getting them into bed yeah and those aren't you know those are of all the things in a, in a movie about a girl with teeth in her vagina these are real concerns yeah you know totally. these are as a coming of age drama it, it it hits grief it hits you know just a heartbreak mm-hmm. and having your expectations of what humanity is repeatedly dashed yeah in the pursuit of like and i don't think there's what's refreshing about it is it's not anti-sex not you know, at all. There's nothing, there's nothing anti-sex about it. And it's like, 
sex is great and brilliant and everybody needs to do it because it's natural. It's kind of yeah. the thing that them on the phone to each other in the locker rooms where they're like, oh, I don't think we should see each other anymore because it's because they're magnetic. Yes. She's attracted to them. So I think it can celebrate sex at the same time as being like, but watch out. <laughs> yeah, totally. I think that's so true. It's it's And again, the film deliberately makes sure that she goes on this journey of, of actually learning to learning to embrace and enjoy sex as well right because yeah. at the beginning she is that kind of archetypal archetypal final girl the virgin the pure one yeah. the, and it really does make a joke out of her in that first act totally. you know she's a caricature and then and then that slowly starts to ebb away as she becomes more more human and more aware and everything and you know that's all really interesting and the character of the brother is a really interesting one i think as well because he is horrible he is scuzzy but he's not he's he never sexually assaults her in the way the other characters do he's kind of in love with her right in a in that weird obsessed way. in a weird obsessed way and uh, you know there's that weird kind of deeply kind of (laughs) freudian thing of like he basically has been attracted to her since he was a child and he's kind of repressed this memory of what she's done with him and he doesn't know why he's so obsessed with her and her body and everything else but it's all of that is really interesting i think i love that penny drop yes that penny drop moment when there is no going back, when mm-hmm. he is in her and realises what he did. <laughs> I mean, no one... You would never be like, yeah, I'm just watching a movie where her stepbrother, while they're having sex, has just realised that the reason he got a cut on his finger was because he tried to do something terrible when they were young. That's You don't feel like you can tell anyone that, no. but it's one of my favourite bits of that movie because it's hilarious and terrific. Again, so that perfect good. line. So that, good. Just that perfect balance. And I'd, I'm honestly trying to think of something that has reached that perfect balance so many times mm-hmm. in so many different scenes yeah. than that movie. One yeah. time, one thing I was thinking about that made, I was trying to think about what has made me laugh and made me despair at the same time. Mm-hmm. And it's that scene in Cabin in the Woods when they're all having the party because they think they've won, but she's just being violently abused on yes. the screens behind. Like, really violently abused, like, properly laying into her. Yeah. And it's hilarious. Yeah. And it's that same... Yeah, it's that sort of subversion. Exact balance. Mm. And I, I know that not everyone is like us, Mike, and not everyone cackles about these things. I do understand that. <laughs> But we do, and that's what matters. We do, and I think because in its own fucked up way, its heart is in the right place, you know? I I really do think that's true with this film, and I think there is a a difference. I think there is a difference with films. It's, do you know what? It is, all of this is about heart placement. You know, you and I have talked a lot about in different horror films where heart is, and obviously the success of Stephen King is because his heart is in the right place. Yeah. You know, they have happy, almost happy endings. Mm-hmm. And I think in order to experience horror, we need to be able to love first. Mm-hmm. And it's finding those exact balances of of blood and guts, but also being brave and bold enough to have a heart that matters yes and that's why this matters yeah i think you know that what you know i mean the reason us horror fans are all such great people is because i think people who love horror have a lot of empathy i think the reason that horror works is because you have to empathize with people with victims to be scared for them right and i think the best horror directors are these actual big softies people like wes craven and all of those types who were actually apparently the most lovely gentle people in the world who actually have a who actually had a real kind of visceral reaction to violence and showed us the horrible things that happen in the world as a way to make us recoil and terrified as well because that's how human beings should react to violence right and i think that is what that's what the effect should be on 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 nice people (laughs) So I think, I think, um, funnily enough, it was in Eli Roth's History of Horror program, but Joe Hill said that horror is just an exercise in extreme empathy. Yes. That's, he, des- he defined horror as that. And I've since he said that, that's literally just sat in my head. It's like, yes. That's what it is. That is it. That's uh, what this is. And, and that's... that's why horror right now is quite reassuring as yeah. well, because we, we can watch it and we can... Really, I mean, I've watched a lot of horror mm-hmm. recently because I actually find I find it difficult to watch other things. It's not that I'm even rewatching horror. It's just like the genre is really safe and it, yeah. and and has unless you're watching an Ari Aster movie and you want to be devastated, like <laughs> yeah. this 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 genre actually will tell you it's okay at the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. after getting through the nastiness and i think i think that's really important especially right now yeah exactly and like you say, you go on those little journeys of nastiness followed by a laugh. 
about five, six times in this yeah. one film, Teeth, right? Totally. I mean, it, it gives you that cathartic laugh every sort yeah. of 15 minutes. And I love that totally. about it. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So there you go. Teeth. I mean, clearly we're, we're both big fans, right? Yeah, we are fans. I'm, I'm looking through my notes to yeah. see if I've got anything particular. Please do. But- say if there's anything we've missed that you want to flag. One thing that I really enjoyed was um, I read in the trivia that uh, they made sure that the the piercing on the fake schlong mm-hmm. from a brother was made out of sugar in case the dog swallowed it. <laughs> oh, that's good. Good. See, nice people really making this film. Lovely, nice people. Lovely people. It also said in the in the credits that I saw last night, and uh, no man was harmed in the making of this movie, which I thought was very important. I love very that. important. I love that. That's brilliant. because funnily enough. Funnily enough, you couldn't put that at the end of The Exorcist. Well, you no. Put, you couldn't put that at the end of Martyrs mm-hmm. because women were harmed yeah. in the making of those movies. Yeah. You know, that there's that Mark Kermode documentary where um, Ellen Burstyn's talking about how William Friedkin literally made the guy pull her even harder and broke her back yes. effectively. So I, that, that's um, while it's a joke for this one that no men were harmed... Lots of women have been harmed in the making of horror movies for a long time. Yeah, it's so, so true. So that's a thing that I can, I'd never really thought about before and I don't want to think about it. No, no. It's not, and of course it's there is fun. that kind of irony and tongue in cheek in them saying that, right? No man was exactly. harmed. That's I think the point. it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Oh, yeah. It's hilarious. But I, I also was just like, I will think about that on a, on a yeah. grander scale and be like, do you know what? That's, that's also quite poignant. It's very true. It's very true. Um, I do yes. love that moment as well. I mean, just the, oh, the, 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 the severed penis and the dog at the yes. end. What a great little end. And because I, he's, that dog has basically been like Schrodinger's dog that whole time. Uh-huh. That's the only reason he's been there is to eat a penis. So good. So and he's good. called Mother. Which is weird. The dog's called Mother. There's so many. I mean, again. The you, layers. The, the Freudian layers of, of that character in particular the brother is hilarious I love that um, and I love the little coda at the end which she's in the car with the old man as well oh. and again oh. again seamlessly goes from incredibly gross and uncomfortable to quite funny and an almost kind of fist punch air punch yes. moment Total right before the credits that smile. Right? yeah that, t- that to like, camera smile is glorious yes and she's like well do you know what fuck you you know that's it and you know he's done for and it's like that's brilliant and again it does it again doesn't it in that sort of brief moment love it so good so uh, before we move on to our next film let's move over to wild about horror and hear what freudian cinephile mary wilde has to say about teeth hey mike mary wilde here This week I have thoughts to share on Mitchell Lichtenstein's black comedy horror film, Teeth. It's the story of Don O'Keefe, a teenage spokesperson for a Christian abstinence group, who makes a vow of chastity and is shocked to discover that she's the owner of a mythical tooth vagina. The director is the son of the artist Roy Lichtenstein, who during the 1960s, along with Andy Warhol and Jasper Johns, became a leading figure in the pop art movement. Mitchell's film plays off on modern art sensibilities. The lead character's name is a direct reference to Georgia O'Keeffe, an American artist best known for her paintings of enlarged flowers, which had a decidedly vaginal aesthetic. The notorious gynecologist appointment scene shows an image on his office wall that is reminiscent of a Georgia O'Keeffe painting reinforcing the looming preoccupation with female genitalia. The quintessentially American obsession with purity and abstinence culture is propelled by the denial of feminine subjectivity. Throughout the film, the education teenagers receive about sexuality seems to hint at womanhood being in the domain of taboo, requiring modesty and secrecy precisely because female sexual agency contains a clear and present threat to the dominance of the phallocentric discourse. Teeth is one of the best cinematic representations of the castration anxiety, an unconscious fear of sexual intercourse with a woman resulting in physical injury. In psychoanalytic theory, castration does not necessarily denote severing of the penis. It is a broader reference to a valued object being removed 
or a life force being depleted where it existed before. In the film, Don and Toby go swimming together. They flirt and kiss, with Don constantly requesting to slow down as she wants to ensure they don't get carried away. They climb inside a cave to get warm and continue kissing, but Toby becomes more physical and aggressive and begins raping Don. She fights back and inadvertently bites off his penis with her vagina. A horrified Don stumbles away and flees the scene, leaving Toby behind who dies of shock in the water. When she gets home, she searches vagina dentata online and identifies with the features she learns about. The vagina dentata is a powerful symbol of violent resistance against non-consensual sex, rendering the body as a force of emancipation against a subjugating discourse that regards the vulva as a black hole engulfing men and cutting them into pieces. The myth sets up sexual intercourse as an epic journey that every man must make back to the womb, the dark crucible that hatched him. Lichtenstein's film plays with the noir trope of the villainous femme fatale who reduces the man from hero to zero. Freud once argued that woman terrifies because she appears to be castrated, but according to the feminist film theorist Barbara Creed, a man's fear of castration leads him to imagine the mother or female lover as an emasculating agency. In horror films, we tend to think of monsters as male and women as victims, but Creed challenges this view and argues instead that the prototype of the monstrous is the abject female body. But maybe the vagina as a mouth of hell does not necessarily need to result from patriarchal hegemony. Perhaps the dangerous cave slur is a nihilist indictment of life itself, designating the woman's reproductive organ as a cursed entrance on the grounds that it ushers in suffering and pain across the board, irrespective of gender or any other immutable characteristic. Another way to approach teeth is via a critique of religious doctrine, specifically on the basis of Freud's 1927 text, The Future of an Illusion, which outlines his interpretation of religion's origins, development, and its future. Freud viewed religion as a false belief system and argued that its concepts are an offshoot of the Oedipus complex, representing human helplessness in the world. Freud regarded God as a manifestation of a childlike longing for a father and expecting to be punished for impulses that are written off as sin instead of examining our own darker nature. Freud concludes in the text that religious beliefs are an illusion with no basis in reality. These beliefs, he said, present the phenomena of wish fulfillment, the wish to cling to the existence of a heavenly father, the prolongation of earthly existence by a future life, and the immortality of the human soul. The individual is perceived as an enemy of society with dangerous instinctual urges that must be restrained to help society function. Freud's view of human nature is that it is antisocial, rebellious, and has high sexual and destructive tendencies, which sets up a pre-inclination for disaster when humans must interact with others in society. The underlying assumption in Mitchell Lichtenstein's film Teeth is that the balance of society is too delicate in the face of the chaotic force of female sexuality, that feminine subjectivity is hostile to the enlightenment principles of reason, temperance, and even criminal justice, that our carefully curated oasis of bourgeois Western family values could implode at any moment if it were not for civilizing forces such as organized religion and the state. It is only when Don O'Keefe drops her purity ring off a cliff and disavows the promise of abstinence that she finally severs ties with the limiting force of religious dogma and begins the process of sexual maturity. The cutting element of the teeth has a double meaning, curtailing of the erotic drive linked with the fear of what the body is capable of, but also a proportionately violent response against oppressive forces that bear down on us. Till next time.
big thank you there to the brilliant Mary Wilde. Don't forget, if you want to hear more of Mary's takes on genre films, you can check out her podcast. That's the Projections Podcast, which she co-hosts with Sarah Cleaver. And if you want to get more information on Mary's courses, she does some awesome virtual online courses about women in horror and various other stuff, uh, then follow her on Twitter. You can find her there at Psychstar. Before we move on to our next discussion, I just want to take a quick moment to thank this week's sponsor. That's $20 patron Trina Findlay. Lovely Trina has been uh, a long-time supporter of this pod, and I'm hugely grateful to her for everything she's done uh, for the podcast over the last couple of years. Uh, Trina sent me a lovely message, which I'm going to read out now. Trina says, Hi Mike, I was fortunate enough to discover Evolution of Horror early on in the Slasher series, and I've been a dedicated follower right from the start. It's been remarkable to witness the growth of the podcast and its community over the last few years. I'd like to echo last week's sponsor, Frank. I also decided to upgrade my Patreon to express my gratitude for EOH and its community, especially over the last year. As a British expat in Australia, it's been especially tough being separated from family in the UK, including my elderly parents in South East London. Christmas was especially difficult this year. EOH has helped me to feel connected, not only to this wonderful community, but also to home, which has been a huge comfort. I've also found comfort in horror more than ever, which only other horror fans can relate to. Because of my increased horror consumption, I've been more grateful than ever to EOH for the ongoing recommendations, which have introduced me to numerous absolute gems. One of these is Raw, which I absolutely loved. It's an original take on cannibalism and reminds me of Ginger Snaps, in some ways. The depiction of the sisters' relationship feels similarly authentic and moving. Justine's awakening hunger as an analogy of her sexual awakening and transition into adulthood is also reminiscent of Ginger Snaps. I'm proud to be a sponsor and I'd like to take this opportunity to say once again a massive thank you to Mike, the amazing co-host of this podcast, and to everyone else in this incredibly caring community for being my surrogate family, particularly during these unprecedented unprecedented times. Thank you so much, Trinley, for that lovely message, and thank you so much for becoming this week's Evolution of Horror sponsor. Uh, I hope you're doing okay. It is always a struggle uh, to be separated from your loved ones, um, and you can't get much more separated than Australia to southeast London, right? That's a that's a long way away from family, so I feel you. I hope you're doing okay, Trina, and I'm so glad that in any small way I've been able to help this last year. Um, and, you know, great there that you said that through the podcast you discovered Raw, and I'm so glad that you enjoyed it. And without further ado, let's segue seamlessly into the second half of this week's episode in which we discuss Julia DeCorno's Raw. <laughs> Okay, Louise, give us a little plot setup of Raw. A young vegetarian goes to vet college to learn to be a vet and discovers after a hazing ritual in which she is forced to eat a tiny fragment of animal kidney that she has a thirst for something more. Mm. Now, this movie, in comparison to Teeth, which we said was kind of, it kind of disappeared into obscurity a little bit. This movie was a big deal when it came out. I don't know if you remember. I mean, it was like really winning over critics. It won awards. I think Mark Kermode put it as his number one film of of the year that it came out. Um, People absolutely kind of gushing over it to this day, like kind of thought of as one of the best horror films of the decade, which I think is really interesting. And I think it's partly, the film is brilliant and it deserves that, but I think it also partly maybe has shown how much audiences have changed in the way they think about Mm -hmm. horror since, for example, Teeth in 2007, right? You know, I think horror and the way we perceive horror has changed so much in the last decade, which is really interesting. I think... It's. I think it's very interesting the attitudes to Raw and how many people have seen Raw because yeah. what they heard about Raw was that it had critics fainting in auditoriums. Brilliant. Yeah. And when I so I was working for Games Radar at the time when it came out and I was really really lucky um, because uh, they knew that I liked horror films and uh, my editor was like, hey, there's this film called Raw. There's you should go to a screening of it and then there's an interview with the director. I was like, oh okay, that's great. Yeah. Um, so I went to see the screening and then in that wonderful way the next day suddenly you're served up in front of the director yeah and of course 
it was probably one, I think it's actually one of my favourite interviews that I've ever done because I could have listened to Julia DeCurno talk about Raw and her reasons for making Raw Mm -hmm. probably forever. I was absolutely enamoured to the point I was so distracted that afterwards I left my notebook because I was left in this like days of like, I could just talk to her forever. But I think (laughs) she has done, I think I was so impressed because not only was horror finally getting some kind of, people were talking about horror in a positive way, Mm -hmm. But she was the one that was doing it and was quietly... She didn't really want... She didn't understandably want to talk about making people faint in auditoriums because her film is so much more than that. And that Mm. was the kind of stuff that Hostel was being given. Or, you know, they were saying, Mm. oh, it's so disgusting. It's like, that's not the point of this movie. The point of this film is not that it's gross. That's it's so, so far from the point. I know it's so funny. It's almost the opposite of the point uh-huh. that the film is wanting yeah. to make, right? Um, but that is really funny. Yeah, and actually, you know, that is a, a really interesting thing. That was certainly the first time I heard about it. And I saw it when I was working at the BBC as well. And I went to see it for the film show. And uh, I think it was at London Film Festival. And at that point, it had already played at a bunch of other festivals like Cannes. And there yes. were already the stories of how people had literally fainted, vomited, yeah. carried out by paramedics. That's it. I mean, this is like crack to me. I was like, yeah. oh, yeah, get me to get see me this it. film. Yeah, couldn't wait, to, my eyes. couldn't wait to see it. But actually, I was absolutely knocked out by it. But I, I was surprised that, yes, it is gross, actually. But yeah. I, but it, it, it almost... It almost didn't feel like a horror film to me no. as much as it does like a, a teen drama. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Like a coming of age film or something. And that, it, that really surprised me. It's properly a coming of age drama. I think I think a lot of the horrors of when you go to university for the first time and especially the university here, it looks like this brutalist nightmare of a prison oh that my she's coming God. into. I, I, I'm so glad that my freshers week wasn't quite this bad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's that's absolutely horrific. It's, it's horrific and you don't, and it's almost that way of you know you're watching a horror film and sometimes if you're watching a horror film and you're like when's the horror going to rock up you know Mm -hmm. and maybe in teeth it was the minute that happened in the cave you know but here you're constantly this is horrible I don't you you always feel unsettled the idea of moving away from home not having a lock on your door having people Mm. chuck mattresses making people I found it really quite unnerving like all of these people getting them out of their beds and pushing them into the hall and they're all a bit bleary and you can remember things like that when you were at uni and maybe the fire alarm went off and you all had to kind of stumble outside it was like that but being made to crawl around in the dark by people called elders and going through these weird strange year of hazing which is horrible it's like university is hell in this yes. right i mean yeah. we've, we've 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 talked about um things like buffy on this podcast and many uh, many films that's like does the whole kind of high school equals hell metaphor this yeah. is very much like college is hell, it's, hell. Oh. Uh, it's like it's not like she's in a dormitory it's like she's in some sort of torture dungeon or something yeah. right like you said or a prison it's absolutely terrifying from the get-go in a very human way because you just feel instantly again speaking of empathy i just feel instantly for this poor girl i'm like just get out of there just get out of yeah, there just leave. this doesn't just, look fun just to leave. me none of this is fun like i think i think it does that amazing thing of balancing it with their their classes and yes. their classes are grim as well <laughs> it's like you know it's like here's a cow just here or you know she's trying to talk to her sister and her sister literally has her arm in oh. a cow like fully in a cow so it, it does this amazing thing where because in the complete opposite of teeth it goes into the physical and the animalistic Mm -hmm. and everything is physical. And I think you're about to talk about like scratching and itching because everything about it is, it never shies away. And I think it does that thing that even something like The Shining does where it gives everything extra beats. You know, you will be introduced to a shot and you will probably have that shot for three seconds longer than you expected to have that shot. And it's because Mm -hmm. you're meant to look and Mm -hmm. you're meant to wait and you're meant to linger because it means that you know when something that you don't want to see happens that you're going to have to watch it for longer than you would like and it does that repeatedly it does it really does and it's um it's just so unflinching isn't it totally. it's so unflinching it's confrontational it's provocative and i love all of that about it but also yeah. it's got so much heart too i think like we keep saying it feels like it's got a lot of heart and it's a, of course you know it's a french film the french my god i mean they know how to do this stuff i mean i've yeah. spoken now at length about 
French horror Alex West talked about it it goes all the way back to things like Grand Guignol and and you know that they've always had this tradition of shocking uh macabre gory images you know in their entertainment and here it continues right again I can't imagine really an American film tackling this story in the same way that Raw does you know I think I think a Hollywood again a Hollywood film would dress it up yeah it would make it hot Yes. It would make it and that's not to say this is not hot. Like it this, is hot. This has it's some, really hot. Yeah, this is like like some of the best horror body horrors. As much it is as much sexy as it is grotesque. And yeah. that is a very uncomfortable thing to sit with as well, you know? Yeah, that's a line, isn't it? I mean yeah. th- I, I love the fact that I I'm going to actually I I won't constantly refer to it, but I my interview with oh, Julia please, yeah. is just it's in an article called uh what, Raw isn't about cannibalism. It's a coming of age. Oh no, Raw is a coming of age drama about cannibalism. That's it, and it's nice. on Games Radar. And I will literally link to it on my Twitter yes. if anyone asks for it. Please um, do. But what she said in that, Julia basically said that she wanted to always be with uh, Justine. We always wanted to be with her and experience everything with her and have mm-hmm. empathy for her, and that's how we can experience the horror with her. But also, she wanted to make it so that especially the relationship with her sister was that they acted constantly like they were part of each other because they were flesh and blood. She mm-hmm. told them to act like they were part of each other. So there's lots of physical stuff where they're standing up peeing together to see if she yes. can pee standing up. So there's that comedy of that, but there's also this closeness in the fact that they're constantly touching each other and she's like trying to pull her, she she plucks her eyebrow for her. She's like, isn't that much better? And she's like, it looks the same. So there's this, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's this lovely relationship between them, but it's really physical as well and it's really there's lots of bodies and nakedness and touching and again which culminates in the waxing sequence which is then the consumption sequence Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's all physical and you're not sure why you should find them hot but you do because it's actually just human and on a day-to-day basis we're pretty thirsty about humans not in a Hollywood sense, because not everyone looks like an Instagram story. Yeah, it is tapping, it's confront. It's confrontational and it's tapping into stuff that maybe we don't all want to admit that we feel ourselves sometimes, yeah. right? And I think there is so much of that in this. This is a very, again, a bit like teeth, a heightened version of what college is like. Stick a whole bunch of horny teens in one place together and they all get sweaty and they all get naked and there's a lot of fluids and there's a lot yeah. of grossness and all of that kind of thing. All of the boundaries come down there is also that weird thing and we talked about this with um the film trouble every day the cannibal film the french one about this woman who who when she becomes sexually aroused she starts eating the men she sleeps with and it's really horrible but um it is um it is tapping into that weird thing about like almost wanting to consume somebody who you love or you are sexually attracted to do you know what i mean there is a fine line between like friendly biting and actual biting and i think there is something that you know do you know do you know it gets i think it comes across really effectively in this film as well that moment where she's so desperate to bite into that guy that she's sleeping with the roommate that she has to bite into her own arm at that point you know yeah and uh it's very powerful yeah that consumption of and desire and it's like what is desire allowed to be what is the safe amount of desire and what is actually desire and what do we hold back and it, asks, mm-hmm. it does ask lots of questions in that way. And like, I think it's, there's a really interesting, when she, in one of the many hazing rituals, when she's been covered in blue paint and then shoved into the bathroom with that guy who is yellow paint and they've been told to make green. Yes. And there's this weird thing where it's kind of like when you were a teenager and it's like, oh, you can get off with him. No, you can get... And there's this weird, like, where well, you're just paired together. Yeah. And you think it's going to be it's this horrible. horrible... You think there's going to be this horrible scene. You're like, oh, God, it's going to be really rapey. But yeah. actually, yes, they kiss. But she's like, oh, I'll try this. And then she obviously bites him because mm. she's hungry. And the conversation she has with the roommate after that is... Um, she, he's like, do you fancy him? And she's like, I don't know. And she mm. doesn't know. And that's the glorious thing about that of like, well, I wanted something. Yes. Maybe a paint covered man wasn't quite that. Yeah. That's interesting. And these are just a bunch of hormonal 
kids who don't quite know what they want, right? Yeah. None of them. I mean, the, the gay roommate is really fascinating. See. What do yeah. you think of that portrayal of that character, this queer character who then ends up sleeping with her and, and like he kind of sort of seems to know what's going on with her and is sort of being there for her and then isn't. And what do you think of that whole dynamic? I think it's really... I think he's, of all of the characters in it, he's really, really fascinating because he yeah. supports her. Yeah. And he... She's weird, right? She's yeah. weird. At what, you know, early on in the film, she sneaks a burger into her pocket and he's like, I'll pay for that for you, but why did you steal it? That's, that's weird. <laughs> yeah. So, and he, but he doesn't back away from her weirdness. And he's also, he's very, very clear about what he is. You know, mm-hmm. he's like, oh, well, you know, he, he calls him, he says, you got a fag mm-hmm. when she's like, I, I asked for a girl. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And then yeah. you see him, you see him, you know, with that guy when she opens the door and he's, just like no no off you fuck i'm having a blowjob no go yes and um so he is very gay and watching gay porn Mm -hmm. like that's very clear of what he's doing so when she's like wants to experiment with him almost i feel like he does that for her and i think it's a kind of exercise in like growth because he always he said he literally says like i didn't hide to now start sleeping with i don't hide yeah. To, yeah. to be with girls now, that's not what I'm doing. And I think, again, it's going down to this sort of animalistic thing where of desire and questioning and double checking, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, like, so I actually think he's a really multi-layered character in the fact that people go, yeah, but he can't do that. He's gay. And it's like, well, you know, everyone can be horny. Everyone yes. can be together. Everyone, Especially can... when you're that age, right? And yeah. you're figuring out exactly what you like and totally. who you are, you know? Yeah, like, that's, I mean, that's what that, that's for in a way, I mean, you know? My own direct experience sexuality-wise, it's not like, bing, girls. That's not. Yeah. That's just not how it works. It's like, no, it doesn't it's happen that like, way for anyone. It's all uh-huh. fluid. It's all a spectrum, isn't it? That's yeah, the thing, and also, it's... like, he, I mean, maybe he does, like, maybe he's discovering that a bisexuality that he doesn't have, whatever is, like... Yeah, he needs to learn. That they're in this melting pot of who they are. Yes, and that's what she, it's pushing buttons. This whole movie pushes like, what do you like buttons? Because yeah. there's, then there's that horrible discussion where the guy's like, yeah, monkey rape, and it's like, let's not talk about that. But yeah. it's got all these weird taboo questions. Yeah, that is amazing. That you shouldn't be comfortable. As well. Yeah, with. it's great. It's great, and I, I I wondered as well whether there is something in this idea of the her her kink. I guess you could say equating to a kind of queerness in his eyes you know that he kind of almost sees a bit of himself in her or his old self in her as the you know because he sort of says look I, I'm, I'm gay now you know that's who I am and he yeah, didn't he knows you know, who he is yeah. but, but obviously he didn't you know maybe pre-college and I think yeah. maybe he's seeing his roommate as somebody who is discovering stuff about herself and he's trying yeah. to sort of be there for her in the way that he's been through that sort of change or discovering himself i think as well and there's a really sweet tenderness in that because he is gay and he's like no i'm i'm not for this this is not for me like this is yeah that's what we did but also there's also like when she is sinking her teeth into her own arm (laughs) and he's like no no stop this stop this again we're getting this really graphic sex that we don't normally see that's not hollywood sex that was you know, rumpled, realistic, trying to get on a bed, but not, oh, we'll go this way, let's try this way. But when she does that, he puts his hand on the back of her head as if it's going to yeah. be okay. And it's really tender and it's Yeah, really it kind of sweet. caresses her. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. And it, it really, he is supportive of her. And he is sadly the victim in all of this, yeah. in the fact that he becomes this weird bait toy between her and her sister. And he's, he doesn't want them. He is, you know, he is who he is. And, but he's become this, this toy to them, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Yeah. And, and it's hard. He's very much objectified in this film, right? As well, which I think is yeah. really interesting. There is a, a real, uh, there is a real, I guess you'd call female gaze on his body in particular, I think, yeah. over any other character when they're watching him play football. Play football. And they are prowling. They are yeah. predatory in a way, aren't they? And like you say, he becomes their their toy thing he becomes their p- literally piece of meat for yeah, them yeah literally you know? a piece of meat and it's so sad because of all the people who are, and he's trying to be her friend as well when he shows her that video mm-hmm. of when she's that is horrific the bit in the the bit in the morgue not what's well, not even yeah. is it a morgue it is a morgue because it's, it's a, a medical morgue. medical yeah. facility um where she's trying to sort of taunt her drunken cannibalistic sister to take a bite of this dead body yeah that's mad and disturbing and strange and amazing 
very strange. We'll come back to the sister in a minute. Let me yes. let me ask you, we've got to talk about this body horror then. I mean, whether or not we'd call this a full-blown horror film, but there are certainly moments of true true body horror in this film, right? And like we touched upon, people apparently got sick in press screenings yeah. and blah, 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 all the usual stuff. Funnily enough, we talked together about Lords of Chaos, didn't we? We yes. uh, watched that together in Glasgow and someone, someone took ill during yes. that screening as well. So this does yeah. happen with this kind of sort of relatable body horror i suppose in a way right um how do you find it how do you find the body horror in this film and the way it's handled i i guess it uh, like what i was saying before about the looking at things for too long Mm -hmm. you look at you look at these body bits for a long time (laughs) yes and and while you were messaging me about how you don't like scratching and itching and and the rash. rashes. The moment when she discovers the rash is, I don't know what it is. For me, that gets me more than any other moment when she, she's, re- and all of those close ups and the sound of her scratching, scratching. it really hard, yeah. you know. And that, that panic, that panic that any human being has if you wake up and you find your skin is covered in something like that, yes. you know, and it's just, yeah. and then her going to see the doctor and the doctor kind of peeling off bits I, of the skin. Okay, okay. I'm going to, I'm just going to say this. I love that bit because <laughs> I'm that person that will peel your sunburn for you. I'm that person. <laughs> I'm that person that will peel your sunburn and probably squeeze your spots. Right. You know, that, that You're one kind of those. Of, I'm one of those. And yeah. I don't feel bad about that. Like I am <laughs> I am a proud I'm not a subscriber of Dr. Pimple Popper, but I have been known to watch, you know, the odd removal of a, you know, I can't remember what they called something like there, she has all these tools that she does special things uh-huh. with. And I, I uh-huh. am fully You're into for that. that. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. So but the body horror that I don't like was when she was chewing her hair. Uh, 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 yeah. So she was chewing her hair and then she was then obviously sicking it up like a giant cat yes. because she'd eaten loads of hair. And I was, I, I literally retched when I was oh. watching that this morning. I retched. Uh, I'd yeah. forgotten. It got me that moment. The, the, throwing, the throwing up of the hair uh, yeah. um, is is really, really horrible. That is worse than the extreme gore for me, that stuff. Yeah. Um, also, I'm not, good with, I'm not good with meat. I mean, I'm a meat eater. Yeah. You're, and you're a meat eater, right? Yeah, I of course you are, because we've had countless Nandos together. Yes. But yeah, the, um, I have a slight fear. I have a slight phobia, I suppose you could call it, of raw chicken. I hate raw chicken. Yes. Like touching it, handling it. And Not I'm one of those. Either. I'm yeah. one of those people. I mean, I, I guess no one loves raw chicken, do they? But, you know, like, I always think of those adverts they used to play on TV where it's like, somebody touches some raw chicken and then you see the blue, like the germs on their hands the dab- and then they'll yes. go and touch things and they'll touch the, ch- the kitchen cupboards. And, <laughs> and like, I always think of like all of the bacteria and the salmonella yes. and all, and just the texture of it and everything. I, uh, and, I don't like the texture. It's a horrible oh. texture. I, th- I fully under. I don't have a phobia of it, but I understand yeah. your distaste yeah. for raw chicken. And I'm not. I'm not much of a. Um, I like steak, but I'm not much of a. I'll have it as bloody as possible steak person. Personally, as well, you are, aren't you? I mean, most people are. I mean, my girlfriend absolutely. She will have the bluest steak you can possibly yep. possibly have. Yeah. Um, I'm. I kind like of dipping the my chips in the blood. <laughs> there you go so it's another element that i personally am not too into on this is this is just all of the raw meat handling you know again for me worse than the gore itself yeah because she pulls that fillet of chicken out of the <gasps> fridge and that's the thing because one you know how that feels to touch sorry mike yeah yeah but two yeah. taking a bite out of that <sighs> she takes a bite of it and the, the shot lasts a little too long just so you know exactly what the resistance of that has. Yes. There's yes. a consistency resistance that meets her teeth. And that's, it's um, very unpleasant. I'm sorry we had to I talk feel... about it. Because do you know what? This is me getting you back for sometimes <laughs> when I listen to the podcast. And you have filled the start of your podcast with so many unpleasant sounds and screams <laughs> that I'm literally like, I'm driving or I'm doing my dishes or can you not take me to the people talking? Well, so you, this... the, you've well and truly got revenge there because I almost felt like a slight lump in my throat then when oh, you were no. talking about the consistency. Well, you're... Do you know what it is? It's... You're going to need to listen again when you edit Yeah, I know. It. <laughs> Do you know what it is? Do you know what? Uh, it's spongy. That's what the consistency yes. of raw chicken is. It's that yes. sponginess that I... Yeah. yeah. Let's move on because I, I can't. Um, but uh, So there's all that stuff. Yeah, it goes from the kind of... The eating of the rabbit liver to the rash to the yes. hair to the throwing up to the raw yep. chicken and that's all before we then get to the, what, the one of the first big set pieces that I think is I think is the, one of the pieces that uh, people got ill from in yes. the cinema which is yeah. 
the waxing followed by the finger being cut off, right? That, uh, yeah. that whole sequence as well, for so many reasons. There are so many elements to that sequence that are uncomfortable to watch, right? There, there's so many elements that are uncomfortable, but again, it's that comedy element. It's that, yeah. it's that dark humour because it's the thing of, well, it's you're, you're going to get bikini wax because this is what is expected of women. Women are expected to have a bikini wax and I will do it for you. And again, it's that whole, your body is my body and therefore I am going to make you fit my sort of ideals. Because there's one point where she pulls her arms up to show yes. that she's got hairy armpits. Yes. And it's as if like, why aren't you shaving that either? And it's like, here's your expectations of a woman. This mm-hmm. is what the expectations are. So the fact that this then, you know, she settles down. One thing I find really disturbing is the fact that the dog is just kind of going around and oh. she's like positioned her. She's put the stuff on. The dog's kind of sniffing around and it's oh. just like, oh, look, here's another Schrodinger's dog that's about to do something I useful. I know. It's yet again, what is it with these films and the dogs as well? Yeah. And of course, there are quite a lot of references in this to the idea of it it can be dangerous to let a dog try human flesh because then they'll crave more and of course that's ultimately what happens to this main character exactly yeah but um yeah but i I do i think there's something in the fact of again it's those close-up shots it's those shots of pubes that we never ever see and it's like why is this taboo why is the idea of waxing taboo what are these expect what are these lofty expectations and all of a sudden you see the ridiculousness Mm mm-hmm of the lofty ideas of the expectations of of womanhood. And not that's not to say that men aren't expected to look a certain way as well. There's lots and lots of pressure on men to look a certain way. But when it comes to what women have to endure in terms of pain mm-hmm. to create what is expected, like nobody has a Brazilian standard. You know, yes. you have you have to go through certain stages to painful stages to get to that. Yeah. And seeing the painting on of the wax and then the tugging. Like oh, the, the fact uh, that, you know, you see the, the you see the hair stretch <laughs> and then it turns out that it's stuck. And these are the kind of these are the kind of issues that happen to people. It's yeah. like, oh, I'm having a problem doing this thing that everyone else does so well. Like whether it's something silly like you fuck up doing your hair dye because you're mm-hmm. trying to get rid of your roots and suddenly you're, you're ginger in, in, in a way that's not the way I dyed my hair last year. You know, you're <laughs> actually just weirdly orange that's not even... And so there's all of these things that can go wrong and this has gone wrong and it's stuck to her, but then it becomes horror like that. Yeah. And it's like, and oh, it's from stuck. A, from such an unexpected place. I mean, it's so yeah. good because the, you, you are absolutely led to think at that point, oh my God, we're going to get some awful, horrific moment involving the wax. Yes. I was thinking in my head, is, he, is she going to rip some skin cabin off? Cabin fever Yeah, yes. basically, you know, we're going to get some awful wax-based body horror here. And of course, we don't at all. There's that no. moment then when she kicks her and the scissors slice off her finger and that comes out of nowhere and that is it's just brilliant isn't it and again really kind of treads that line between being absurdly funny and yes. really horrific as well yeah. because then of course her having a little nibble on the severed finger as well yes. and just everything that happens in that scene is so good the nibbling especially i think it's <laughs> that finger suddenly has a character of its own so you've <laughs> you've pivoted you've gone oh gosh now we're at the horror oh, no, now it's really silly and the, the sister's keeled over and there's a, this pool of blood under her yeah. finger. But but now she's got the finger because she was going to store the finger, wasn't she? She was going to yes. put it in the fridge yes. and she was then holding it. And this little finger, and then there's just blood falling out the bottom of it, which yeah. is weirdly physical because, of course, it would because mm-hmm. your finger's full of blood until it's not on your hand anymore. Mm-hmm. And then she kind of, like, dips it a little bit. Mm-hmm. There's the, There's... It basically becomes, I'm sorry to use the pun, but I'm going to do it, it's finger food. Because it's finger food! She's, <laughs> because she's playing with it. Yeah. And then she kind of licks her hand, covering blood, and then she starts nibbling on it like a chicken wing, like <laughs> round the outside, yeah. like a little tea thing, and then before she goes, big nose. Yep. But it's the fact that that's all kind of effortlessly gone on this roller coaster of bonding activity, relationships, mm-hmm. horror terrible accident lol oh god <laughs> and yeah. and and you've just been taken on that perfect miniature journey that mm-hmm. would even that alone stand alone would work really well as a short even yes. if it wasn't in the middle of such a glorious thing yeah even you're that so because right. it's such a lovely little arc yes and then of course the the and then again it goes into some then real kind of 
almost kind of um, drug allegory, cold turkey kind of horror, right? Again, yeah. which is something I find incredibly powerful and effective and disturbing. But as, as she is craving this flesh, there's that amazing sequence that is like something out of Train Spotting or Requiem for a Dream, where she's in the bed sweating it out, right? And, yeah. and having these cravings. And there's that loud, jarring noise. The sound design is amazing. It's like, you know, things are hitting her in the bed. And I just, I mean, I just think this film is just. Um, stunningly directed Julia Ducano has just done the best job with this you know it's so good yeah I think think what you're saying about the sound is really interesting because the music does a really good job of sometimes it does those like um aster type big and you know horrible things are happening but she does a really good job with kind of there's one point I think I think it is with the finger there's kind of like happy strummy music Mm -hmm. yeah before it turns into food Yes, and things then get nasty. So it it follows the tone, and I think that's that. I think it's a really modern horror thing, actually, in the fact that this is one of those films that doesn't it doesn't have any rules. It does have no. a structure, but it doesn't have any rules, and its structure is living through this and becoming powerful and making these relationships and internal discovery and because the final act is when there's this bell and suddenly all of the students kind of like stagger out of wherever they've been kind of like 28 days later they're all wrapped in duvets and stuff and they kind of come to life and this is her success you know this is her you've made it through the ritual yeah yeah you're right it's um it it doesn't have rules it's messy it's deliberate everything about this film is messy isn't it it it, it's not going to give you a conventional horror narrative it's not going to give you a good guy and a bad guy really Mm -hmm. uh it doesn't go in the directions you want you you might be much more horrified and grossed out by the moments that maybe aren't as overtly horrific and um and it does it all with such style as well i mean the other thing is you know you think a kind of veterinary school you think it would be kind of like kind of grim looking i suppose but it's really you know the 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 bursts of color like when they're all covered in the paint and the lights when she's in the she's really drunk at the party and the music and the lights in that sequence and obviously the buckets of blood it's like something out of carry when they get that photo taken you know and the blood pours on them all everything is kind of stained with sort of blood reds and blues and greens and all of that kind of thing as well and the bloods the blood is congealed at points <laughs> oh it and, just, and they have it on the, their skin for just yeah. days and that's yeah. what's i think that's what's so like again that physicalness like, yeah tactile it, yeah. yeah there's there's clots. <laughs> 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 like, there's this, there's, when she, I think she's standing in the shower and uh, there's sort of washing around the, the, like she's showering the sister and mm-hmm. there's like little cl- clots. And I think that again is the feminine, mm-hmm. you know, that again is women experience blood mm-hmm. on a monthly basis. Yeah. And that's, women aren't afraid of that. And it yeah. was something that, again, you were talking about in the, was it the hostel? It was the hostel episode you were talking about, yeah. like, oh, discovery of period. Yes. And yes. it's this kind of horror of that. And I think there's an, I think there's definitely an empowerment and uh, people who deal with blood on a daily basis, you know, sometimes and the internal struggles that people have with their own physicality, I think mm-hmm. raw just effortlessly effortlessly works with in a really interesting way in the way that we wish all horror films could be sometimes so good isn't it we're we're so it's so smart we're so spoiled i think with horror movies right now like these last sort of few years right that that this is the sort of the caliber that we've been getting you know from our horror um it's so wonderful what do you think of this finally then let me ask you about this this core relationship between the sisters at the centre of this whole story really and really the story of this family I mean we don't really see much of the parents but it's just as much about the mother by the sounds of it right as it is these two siblings Um, what do you make of the character of the sister as well because you know ultimately she's she's pretty nasty isn't she through a lot of the film the way she taunts her when she's drunk but the way they kind of look after each other to then obviously she's the one that I'm assuming actually murdered the roommate at the end what do you think of her the thing is i don't i don't think she's nasty i don't i actually weirdly like i don't think she's particularly mean other mm-hmm. than that weird bit with the drunk stuff which i think she's angry at her sister uh-huh. i think 
I think if we think about the relationships that we have with our siblings, especially when we were younger, maybe uh-huh. not now, I think you look at the relationships between siblings and you're like, why are you being so awful to each other? It's like when yeah. you watch you watch a teen movie and anything you watched when you were a teenager, you were fine with the way that teenager treated their parents. But yes. now you watch it and go, why are you being so rude? Yes. Now, I think, I think, I think it's actually a very good sibling relationship. I think they are, they do act like they're each other. Like Justine's yeah. clearly really annoying. Like she's sitting doing her sister's work. She's been, oh, I labeled up some mistakes. You made a few mistakes. <laughs> yes. And it's almost like she doesn't understand that the really, the really obnoxious teacher had done exactly the same to her yes. and said, you've made some mistakes here. It's too late. You can't change it. And that's mm-hmm. really annoying. Having mm-hmm. someone do that is really, really annoying. Someone, she's like, I, I literally came here to give you, you've got here, you want clothes. I'm giving you clothes. I'm giving you shoes and you're giving me shit. Yeah, so she kicks, her, she kicks her out of her room. Mm-hmm. But she doesn't, she's not mad at her when she, you know, nibbles on her finger. No, no. She's not mad because she knows and she's been through it. And while she's horrible in other ways, that's not what she's horrible about because she mm-hmm. understands blood is thicker than water that way. And I think they do have a combative relationship. But I think that big fight that they have where everyone's looking at them like they're crazy when they're literally sinking their teeth into each other's arms. Yeah. So like, good. that's a real, that's just a sibling battle. Oh, and totally. They, it's and they a moment when they are, and they are literally kind of like you keep saying, they are as one at that yeah, point. And they right, patch each well. other up. And there's, yeah. a, there's a tenderness to it. And there's a sweetness to it. And even though by the end, obviously she's angry at her sister, her sister j- just, they both did it. She had blood around her as well, didn't she? Mm. You know, she'd, she'd helped. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, also, can I say that I was just really impressed by the fact that she was holding a controller? Like, <laughs> <laughs> cannibal gaming girls for the absolute win. Cannibal, so good. cannibal, uh, honestly. I am all for the fact that she was sitting there glassy eyed playing a video game on PS4. I love it. With a finger with missing as well. With a finger missing and the yeah. blood all over her and the guy with the missing. That makeup on that leg. Oh, that was unbelievable. Oh my God. That's a nauseating reveal as well, yeah, isn't it? Was. it? And, and I do feel sad for that poor guy. <laughs> I feel really sad for him. He was just trying to look out for someone that he saw as an outcast. Yeah. And he'd previously been an outcast and he knew who he was. Yeah. And yeah, she kind of came in and just was like, "Nope, gonna nope. eat you." Eat him up, exactly. Yeah, um, and so and it is. It's a really sad, tender moment at the end when it's revealed what the sister did and her showering her and everything. And then that sort of final, final little coda where we were. It's revealed that also their mother is the same, right, yes. as well. And they they speak briefly, don't they, about how the sister has kind of always been a bit. The dad almost makes out like she's always been a bit of a wrong and potentially the older sister, right? And that yeah. she didn't quite fit in with the family. She never really got on well with the mum, really, from what we sort of learned from yeah. her as well. So there's these kind of like weird dynamics that are like just hinted upon enough, I think, which is really interesting. They're, they're, the relationships are kind of fascinating that way in the fact of like, I mean, presumably... Let's think about this. Logically, it's not really the way to do it. But really, you wouldn't just bring your children up as vegetarian if you knew that having meat would make them want to eat people, right? (laughs) Because, I mean, really the risk of like, maybe there'd be a birthday party at McDonald's and you would have a chicken nugget and all of a sudden you'd have eaten all your friends. And it's like, Mm -hmm. well, surely you would have brought them up and said, hey, you're cannibals. Mm -hmm. Or you would have brought them up as cannibals, you know, in a kind of, leather face way you would have just moved you'd have just moved out to somewhere and then people would have rocked up and you'd have eaten them like there was definitely a happy family's way i mean it wouldn't be great for everyone else and that would be a very different (laughs) film but i do feel like there would be a better way to find out you're a cannibal Mm -hmm. than that Mm -hmm. and i think that's why the sister probably resents the parents so much is because she had to endure it alone and then i think if she had to endure it alone the reason that she gives justine such shit is because she never had a big sister who was helping her. Yes. And she has to be supportive and is probably internally like, I didn't have anyone. No one mm-hmm. helped me. Why should I help you? So I guess that's the push and pull of that too. It's yeah. like, I literally killed these people in this car for you and you've rejected me again. Yeah, you're so right. Yeah. You know, and it's like, I didn't have that. I had to work out how to do this. I had to 
presumably had to work out where in a road to go to make people hit, <laughs> hit a tree oh, to God. then murder them yeah. further. <laughs> yeah. Kill them again. <laughs> but yeah, I think there's a definite, like, there's a struggle there. Her, her, her coming of age is almost the sequel to what her sister's been through without mm-hmm. any support. Yeah, you're that's, absolutely right. That's sad, really. Yeah, it is really sad. It is, yeah. It's a really interesting, what a lovely kind of nuanced sort of portrayal as well of all these mm. characters as well. There's, the performances are cracking. Just incredible, yeah. Everything about this movie works, I think. Like everything, every element, whether it's the cinematography, like we've talked about the sound design, the music, the performances, the gore, the practical the effects. It yeah. all works perfectly, doesn't it? It's so good. We need more from... Where is Julia de Kernel? What where is she, is she making? I don't know. What is we... she making now? Because I suppose the one thing that... Because she she didn't really want... like We didn't talk about the sort of people fainting thing because that's mm-hmm. not what an auteur director wants to talk about is people being sick at their film. That's not what they want to talk about. And I wonder if like the response to any of her film next will be mm-hmm. director of the film that made people throw up has made this now. Yeah. yeah that's I a shame. So. I, don't, I don't want it to be a one... Like I want more. No, and I and I get the feeling that she may not necessarily go on to be a quote unquote horror filmmaker, right? She might not be a, a Mike Flanagan or an Ari Aster. She might go off and do something completely different next. Yeah. I don't know, you know. But when it, she she talked about how she has so much respect for Cronenberg uh-huh. and how Cronenberg made movies about things that just happen to be horror films. Exactly. Yeah. And exactly. I think. And I'd like it if she did that again, because I think she has an awful lot to give oh. in in that way. Like, I, I, I don't think, I think when I saw that, I was genuinely just floored by it. Yeah. Just like, this is, this, I've never seen anything like this before. I've never felt quite like this before watching something like that had this sheer feeling behind it. Do you think it, do you, uh, to ask like a really sort of <laughs> crass basic question, can you feel as a female viewer that this is made by a woman? Yes. Do you know, I think that, I think we, we talk a lot about the male gaze and the female gaze. Mm-hmm. And I I think that sadly a female filmmaker doesn't, doesn't just have to make with a female gaze. Uh-huh. She won't get away with just the female gaze. There has to be so much more. Mm-hmm. It's almost like there's again another double standards of representing woman as a woman. Yeah. And I think... And and what she's done is, yes, this is a film about a woman, but it's not a film, as we have discussed, that only a woman could enjoy. Yeah. And again, she said in the she said in the interview that she wanted to make a character she didn't just want to make a character that women could relate to. She wanted to make a character that people could relate to. Mm. You know, she, she she I think she referenced um I reread the interview and I wish I could have found the transcription because it was great to listen to and obviously I had to cut stuff out, but she talked about how when people watched the revenant women were equally as appalled by, you know, a bear yes. uh, tense, you know, as, as tense and scared of a bear eating Leonardo DiCaprio as men are. And, yeah. and that is funnily enough because we're all human. Yeah. But I do think that there's definitely a, there's certain things that a woman can bring to the female experience. You know, I, I, I fully believe that a man could have made a bikini wax sequence. That's not why I'm saying that they couldn't, but I mm-hmm. do think you understand the intentions behind that sequence. You understand yeah. the immediate thing of, wow, this is women have really unrealistic body expectations, and 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 wow, is this exactly what men want from us? And is this what women want from us? And mm. what does everyone want? And why am I not that? And I think that's yeah. the inherent thing that everyone can really relate to. But I do think she adds a certain poignancy to the coming of age experience. And I think it's why, you know, movies like um, Ginger Snaps and American Mary and these movies about women realising who they are and not really liking what they see in the mirror and embracing it or not embracing it as the case may be. Mm -hmm. Like, I think there's a definite... I think I am not a expert in any feminist horror stuff you know you we have Anna of wonderful for that she's <laughs> yes. incredible but I do think that we need more um because we need balance and we need to mm-hmm. be able to see other experiences and there's so many underrepresented voices aren't just women you know we we need people of all sexualities and genders and races to be able to say what it is like to be be that person that is not just a straight white male yeah and i think we've seen that a lot you know it's not just women mm-hmm. you know we need black voices and we need we need strong uh like trans voices and yeah. people who 
we just we need more and mm-hmm. I think that's the thing that I think that wasn't this was not the question you asked me but it's the direction I'm going because no, you're absolutely we right. just need so many voices to make up the wonderful melting pot that is horror because actually horror gives us a great place to do it because it gives us a nice palatable place to take on our fears yes. where everyone understands. And it's so exciting to watch a story that you just haven't heard a million times. Like, uh, you know, the, the even from a really kind of um, basic story point of view, it's so much better to to consume different stories made totally. by different people. Like, Rich. you know, my favourite f- my favourite film of last year was His House. And it was because I was like, oh my God, not only is it just such a brilliant ghost story that's really well crafted, but it's like, I've never Ever seen a story like this about these people about what they're going through and it's like this is something new in the ghost genre that i've never watched before because yeah. nobody usually gets to make films like this about yeah. people like this you know and it's like it's just important for to get fresh horror isn't it more than anything yeah. else yeah and it's and it's it's also almost embarrassing that it's taken so long mm-hmm. to be able to put stories in places it it shouldn't you know i think us talking about how horror can tackle things and how we can talk about the how body horror is almost a really safe place to talk about taboo imagery you know and and to these things shouldn't be taboo and if these if if the idea of a shot of damaged male genitalia is taboo we don't have a chance of showing exactly what uh, you know the, the wide gamut of 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 horror horror entertainment and you know in in turn with that analytical you know critical analysis mm-hmm. could come from people telling stories that are different like, yeah totally and if there's one thing that more. we and if there's one th- subgenre that can you know go with any race any gender any age group any culture it's body horror because you strip us all down and we're all the same on the inside we've right all we've, all got, we've all got skin we've all got blood and got skin. skin we've all got fingers that come off we've all got genitalia we've all got all of yep. this other horrible stuff that we're all so shocked and disturbed and horrified by because we're all so repressed so it's always yes, going to scare absolutely. us no matter where we're from totally we're massive <laughs> you're absolutely we are massively repressed and because and i think that's interesting as well and i think that's why we are we've talked about an american movie and we've also is, is it american before i yes, of yes. assume that teeth is american um yeah. th- we have and then we have a french movie mm-hmm. and it's not a coincidence that that is a french movie because no. i mean that's not going to be a british movie you know the, no. the attitude to skin and sex and you know honesty about things that that was never going to come from that was no. never going to come from the uk no exactly um yeah yeah it's yeah. that because you look at it and you're like this is definitely a french film and you're like but why why am i why do i feel like this i know it's weird <laughs> isn't brought it? me up to make <laughs> like what kind of media shaped me into this and yeah. we're all distinctly so shaped um by by especially the horror we consume and yeah, oh we yeah need to, we'd much yeah, rather I, a stuffy repressed ghost story about a spirit in the attic i think us yes, brits wouldn't we yes, yeah of course you know <laughs> where everything the... goes unsaid and it's all creaks and floorboards i mean which i'm all for as well but oh, it's absolutely. so true it's so true yeah. we do really when you look at it you know we do all certainly have a type don't we yes, our uh, that... you know our cultures our nations and yeah. the sort of horror we, horror we produce yeah yeah I think that, you know, I'm looking at, you know, we're talking on Zoom and you have a massive collection of DVDs behind yeah, you. Yeah. And that, you know, a lot of those are the same types of stories. And I want yeah. different stories. Yeah. And I think, you know, we've got, there will be more. Lockdown will, I think the pandemic will produce oh, yeah. a new type of horror. I don't, I don't know what kind of horror. Mm-hmm. But I think that's yeah, quite I know. an interesting concept. What will we get other than host? What will we get that is lockdown horror? I'm so excited to find out I, actually. I I don't want I don't want terrible host oh. rip offs. And they will come. They will come. Of they course will they come. will come. Yeah. But what we do have is we have the host guys Blumhouse. Movies. Oh my god. I also so really interested. What I don't think I'm ready for yet either is a COVID pandemic horror either. Nope. Like I kind mm. of and I, I feel like we're you know what I think what was so great about Host which me and you talked about is that it wasn't a covid movie it was a lockdown movie yes uh, that was a ghost story you know it didn't yeah. matter that it was about covid and I I don't really want to see like a zombie outbreak style movie from no. this you know like I'm no. ready to see more interesting different escapist stuff I think I think maybe that will be the direction an escapist direction mm-hmm. I mean mm-hmm. I can we could definitely go back into some body horror in terms of the new horror films we have coming out, we have obviously we're going to have another Halloween. 
in October yes. that was moved from last one. Uh-huh. We have The Return of Saw. Yes. Spiral, Book of Saw. We have Candyman. Mm-hmm, which I'm most excited about. <clears throat> and we have more Conjuring. So we actually have a lot of... The big varied, players, yeah. Big, we've got the heavy hitters. We've got really, the big hitters, yeah, indeed. Amongst, hopefully, many other things. Um, and yeah. also there's even... There's a Netflix thing coming out next month called Red... Is it this month? Red Dot? Which Ooh, yeah. is about... a the, com- the couple that wake up in a tent under a sniper scope, which is quite interesting. That sounds very simple. That sounds great. Effective. Love yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. And of course, you know, and every year always starts like this. Like, you know what the big movies are coming out throughout the year. You know that there's going to be a new whatever screen movie. Yeah. or But it's, I'm so excited to hear, oh my God, everyone went to Toronto and saw this movie yeah. that no one was expecting that people fainted in and people screamed in. You know, I can't wait to hear whatever that movie is going to be this year, you know. That, but also that movie, again, like last year, depending how this year goes Mm -hmm. might be digital and we might all be able to see it and i think that's one thing that pandemic has really taught us is that if if people can make those meetings happen those magical meetings that mean things arrive on streaming services Mm -hmm. and everybody gets paid including the filmmakers yeah yeah (laughs) um, yeah that's great yeah and the faster we can see them because i always i always hate the fact that you and i can have a discussion about what's on at fright fest and then two years later someone can go oh was this that film you saw at fright fest i know i found it on amazon prime like, yes <laughs> that would have been a lot easier to tell you to watch straight away i know <laughs> like, exactly exactly remove that remove those barriers it's true but there's no point in those barriers right now is there that's no, the thing so at all. let's hope well there you go this went from a body horror chat to a general industry chat S- sorry, um, sorry no no i love it i love it <laughs> amazing well louise thank you so much for this it's been an absolute joy i might go it's have myself lovely. a little rare steak for lunch now or something grab some chicken mike yeah exactly um tell us where people can find you and more of your stuff out there online uh you can find me on twitter i am at shiny underscore demon and you can find me there with all my actually do um i'll tweet it out once the episode runs but my games radar uh interview with julia We'll say a lot yes. of the same stuff that I've said today, but it's really she was really genuinely fascinating to, to talk to. So any any time you can read her words, do do that, and I will link to that. That would be amazing. Perfect, Louise. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening and a huge thank you to this week's guest, the brilliant Louise Blaine. How I've missed Louise. Louise, let's not leave it so long this time. Come back again soon. So uh, please do get in touch. What do you think of this week's films? How are you with all of this squishy, squeamish body horror in these two movies? Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts. Tell me what you think of Raw and Teeth. Get in touch. The email address is evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Letterboxd. And if you want to discuss this week's films with fellow listeners, come and join the discussion group. That's the Evolution of Horror discussion group and that can be found on Facebook. One more time, a huge thank you to this week's sponsor, Trina Findlay. And if you want to become an official Evolution of Horror sponsor, you can sign up to our Patreon, patreon.com slash evolution of horror. If you sign up at the $20 level, you do become a sponsor and get all of the bonus benefits but you can also sign up at a $5 or $10 level and get different treats accordingly. Uh, You can find this podcast on all major podcast platforms, including iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, Acast, Libsyn and Spotify. If you get a spare minute, I would be hugely grateful if you could leave us a little rating or review on Apple Podcasts, which really helps us get discovered by new listeners. Okay then, next week. Next week, it gets nasty even nastier than it has been previously. Uh, We're reaching sort of peak extreme body horror here as we move towards the beginning of the 2010s and we see what exactly happened when all of this craze of body horror and torture porn kind of culminated into the most extreme thing imaginable. Next week, I'm going to be joined by two guests, Dan Martin and Zobo with a shotgun, and we are going to be discussing Tom Six's The Human Centipede 2. Uh, Now, I just want to (laughs) emphasise, I'm not recommending people watch this film. Uh, Usually, of course, I would say give the film a watch before listening to our discussion. 
please, unless you really, really feel like you want to, do not feel compelled to watch Human Centipede 2. I repeat, do not feel compelled <laughs> to watch Human Centipede 2, but I would still be very grateful if you would listen to our discussion because I think it's going to be fascinating. Join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror. <laughs>